Hi everybody, I'm your friendly neighborhood accountant Eric Stockhausen. I'm going to be guiding you through summarizing and giving my opinion on CD Projects third quarter 2017 financials and announcements. Before we dive into the financials, I want to explain why a gamer, a fan of Gwent, and a fan of Cyberpunk 2077 would even care to look at them in the first place. I've been analyzing CD Projekt for more than a year now. I, actually, my first video on them was for their um, 3Q of 2016. And in that year, I have made some observations. The first observation was that they often announce, um, make announcements for the games in tandem with the release of their financials. With the Q3 2017, it was that um, Thornbreaker was going to be delayed and that they're going to make some changes to their technology stack to help um, make their collection system work better for expansions and other things. The second thing is that they have these Q&A sessions during their financial releases where investors and news groups, financial groups come in and ask a bunch of questions of their CFO and their CEO. And the questions are often very similar to what gamers are asking. When is the game going to release? What features will it have? When will it come out in X country? How will it be released in that country? The final thing that's interesting um, observation that I made is that by looking at these financials and listening to these announcements, I've been able to make predictions. I actually knew that the Q3 was going to be releasing around this week or Thanksgiving week for Americans. And uh, that they would probably have an announcement probably doing with the delay of Thornbreaker. By listening to the news, listening to rumors and stuff like that, I was able to kind of piece together a picture of what was happening. And by looking at the general delay of the financial statement releases this year, I was able to kind of guess that it would be three weeks later than last year's. So I knew that an announcement was coming up. And that was pretty good. And I'm going to show you some other things that we can make predictions by looking into this financial about the future of Gwent and the future of CD Projekt. Without further ado, we're going to go look at some of those numbers. The first thing we're going to look at is the assets and liabilities or the balance sheet. But really, we're just focused on the expenditures on development projects. Well, development projects just refer to games they haven't released yet or stuff they haven't released. This includes Cyberpunk 2077, and it refers to uh, Gwent and Thornbreaker. We might notice that it's increased, and note these numbers are in thousands, 19,618,000 zloty, or Polish currency. That's a 20% increase, which is pretty big. Uh, and uh, that we to kind of parse that out, there is a three to one ratio between the amount of developers working on Cyberpunk 2077 and the ones working on Gwent. You can't compare them completely because Gwent is live technically. And so some expenses are just immediately recognized because it's a live game. However, you can kind of get an idea that most of this is probably going towards Cyberpunk 2077.
The first thing you probably noticed on CD Projekt's income statement were all these negative blue percentages for the year-on-year -year change. Now, these look bad, but in the grand scheme of things, they're to be expected. There were no major releases this year other than the public beta for Gwent, while in last year they had Blood and Wine and Witcher 3 Game of the Year edition come out. These generated a lot of revenue when they came out, and the more important thing is they have had continued sales up like fewer this year and this quarter. The fact that Witcher 3 Game of the Year edition keeps on selling is something that CD Projekt brags about. The Witcher franchise has this effect where it stays in the public consciousness and people keep buying it well after the game releases. Most games, they just fade in obscurity a month or two after their release. Witcher 3 stays in people's minds and people keep buying it. If you add up all the bars of the quarters after it's released together, you get a bar larger than the bar you get on its original release. The next thing to notice is that net profitability is up year on year for the three periods described on this income statement. The reason for this is that sales revenue has decreased slower than expenses have. This is not some stroke of genius by CD Projekt, but rather how the expenses work in relation to revenue in, for video games. So if you think about how a video game, um, the cost related to a video game, the most notable two is marketing and development. Marketing really only happens in the month that a product is being released and there's like not anything notable like a year later. For um, development, development was what we were talking about on the balance sheet earlier. It gets released as an accounting rule when the video game is released as well and it just kind of all comes out during that quarter. Now it's a year later, we don't have any major releases, uh, those expenses are gone. And the revenue is still present. So the fact that you're still getting the revenue from the game while not having those two major costs present results in an increase in net profitability. Let's dive a little deeper into the income statement and look at GOG specifically. GOG is a subsidiary of uh, CD project and as a result it has its income statement included alongside the consolidated financial statements um, It's important to Gwent because not only do PC players have to download it in order to play the game, but GOG um, Handles things like matchmaking and player accounts It has its own development team and I believe it's responsible for the fact that we can play against people on the opposite side of the world seamlessly without having to change servers. Uh, like you would have to on um, like Hearthstone if you wanted to play on the EU server, for instance. Uh, the thing that you're going to notice first is that all the year-on-year -year changes are positive, and the reason for this is Gwent. Gwent is the larger contri largest contributor um, to revenue on the site. It it's a big impact, it's like 40% of the revenue comes from the microtransactions of Gwent. You might also notice that the net profitability is low. Um, GOG is not all that profitable. It's becoming more profitable because the um, Gwent players, because they had uh, the PC Gwent players, because they had to download the client, are now exposed to the other products that GOG sells and are therefore have a higher chance of buying them than they did when nobody pretty much had a GOG account because uh, everybody was going to Steam or whatever. GOG is also nice because it's not CPU intensive, um, which makes it a pretty good client to download. Okay, now we're gonna look at the disclosure for significant accomplishments and shortcomings for CD Projekt. This is basically their brag sheet of what they thought they did good this year because they don't really talk about shortcomings in my experience ever in this section. Uh, even though they have made shortcomings, like for instance, Thornbreaker was delayed. Um, they split it up into two sections, but most of it is CD Projekt Red and CD Projekt Red is most of the company. So it makes sense. Uh, while they do mention Cyberpunk 2077 right here, they do not talk about it anymore in this section. So for those looking for news on Cyberpunk 2077, 
there isn't any. It's just mostly Gwent news. And none of this is really going to be new to people who've been paying attention, except because uh, they talked about the new things that added to the game, like ma streamlining matchmaking and player profiles, news, notifications, um, the starter pack for people. And the starter pack is actually important for monetization, by the way. The Pro Ladder and the Gwent Master Series. The thing that people won't know is that they opened it up in the People's Republic of China and they have a closed beta there. China's going to follow a different schedule for their beta than we are and we don't even know, I mean, the rest of the world is. We. <laughs> um, and we don't even know if they're going to release as a full game at the same time we, um, the rest of the world does. The marketing events, they talk about the GamesCon Cone where they had the Gwent Open. On the Gwent Open, um, Shaggy is actually named by name in the financial statements, which as an accountant, I think there's a really great honor because I can't, ima I can't imagine any other company actually naming a player inside their financial statements. <laughs> um, was the wild card entry and won the entire tournament. It was cool. Uh, they talk about how big the prize pool was. They had 900 media representatives and business partners attend uh, for the Gwent Thornbreak um, Thronebreaker and uh, the Gwent Masters reveal and then note that their partners are IGN, Twitch, Xbox, and Alienware um, also kind of showcase their game. Uh, they have the Round of Gwent thing that's happening now that you guys can watch on their website and they had other conventions. GOG uh, added a few games to their catalog. They're bragging about having Divinity Original Sin 2 which is a good game. Um, they had Hellblade, and Cuphead, Cuphead, and Hub. Last year, and this is an example of a shortcoming they didn't talk about, they had No Man's Go Sky was their big, look, we have that game. Aren't we amazing? It sold amazingly well. Problem is, that game was a huge flop. So the fact that you had it on your catalog, even though you knew it was already a flop by the time this financial statement came out, is troubling that you listed it as an accomplishment as opposed to a shortcoming. They have a way of kind of cropping out the shortcomings from the descriptions here. So if one of these games ended up being a flop, um, they wouldn't mention that here. They'd just say, this game sold well on release. Now we're going to look at the transcript for the conference call for their presentation. They had on their um, <laughs> financials. For every time they release their financials, they have like a big, you know, presentation. The slides we saw earlier in this video come from that presentation. These are the same ones the investors saw. We're just going to skip down to the Q&A section. It's a transcript now because it was all done on phone. The first question they had comes from AR who works for Long Term PL or Poland. They misspell it here. I'm going to go talk to uh, CD Projekt real quick. Hey, you guys need an editor. You have misspellings in most of your, like I, run, I see them all the time in your English translations for both your presentations and your patch notes and just these kind of documents. I'll be your editor. My credentials, I edit some of the most difficult things to edit in existence amateur fan fiction. I'll move to Poland. I'll learn per Polish. Hire me. I'll help you with these things. And that, if that's not enough, I'll also work as a data analyst. Okay. Now let's return to these questions. So AR asked two questions. One's about dividend policy. The other one's about the approximate development budget for Cyberpunk. Real quick, the CEO answers that the they don't have a cons uh, dividend policy yet. The big dividend they gave earlier, not going to be a regular thing. The approximate development budget for Cyberpunk is going to be bigger than Witcher 3. That's to be expected. Even Poland is helping them pay for some of the stuff they're making in Cyberpunk 2077. Next question comes from Reuters. He asked follow-up questions about budget. Uh, the CEO can't answer any of them, not even the CFO. Uh, they're not, it's just their policy not to mention very specific stuff about this. Uh, next one is a hardball question from PS representing Rockbridge TFI. 
Uh, he asks about the 50 unfilled positions for Cyberpunk 2077. They're rapidly increasing the size of their teams. They talked about trying to have 800 employees. Uh, the CEO basically responds by um, saying that uh, they want to organically grow the company and their primary mode of expansion is large scale recruitment drives. Uh, the problem with this is that they're also hiring Westerners uh, outside of Poland. And Poland has a low cost of living compared to other countries like the United States. And if you hire somebody from the United States, uh, they're going to compare the salary they're going to get from CD Projekt and think that they're getting underpaid. And this, this will increase uh, employee turnover. The other thing is if you employ, hire a bunch of people right away, instead, uh, that means you have to hire some less qualified applicants. You want to have highly valuable employees for um, CD Projekt. And they do have really talented people working for CD Projekt. Some of the best people in the industry want to work for this company especially in Poland. Um, but if you get less qualified people, not only um, you're going to have to have the infrastructure for the training, the HR and all that stuff. And I'm not sure if uh, CD Projekt has developed that yet because they're in increasing the size of their teams so fast. And this, a lot of this stuff is new for the company. Uh, another question they ask is about China. So as I said earlier, China is going to have a different release schedule than the rest of the world. Um, part of this is that they have a local distributor handling things. Second is that and that pretty much is most of it. Uh, they got into open beta. They're in closed beta right now, and they're going to have an open beta later. We might even be in full release for Gwent, and they still will be in open beta. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to play with the rest of the world uh, due to the way um, uh, China handles stuff. The next question comes from uh, JT at Generali. Generali is an Italian, a large Italian insurance uh, company. He asks a really hard boy, uh, ball question about the recent allegations by YouTuber Yang Ya. Uh, Yang Ya is pretty big channel on YouTube. He does quasi independent um, jur journalistic game journalistic videos. I say quasi independent because he's on Patreon. So by financial definition, I would say he's not independent. People are paying him to do his stories as opposed to, you know, like buying the stories off of him. Uh, long story short, young. Yeah published three videos during the Q3 period, which the general gen uh, idea was not everything is right with CD Projekt, but they have um, petty um, office politics and there's a lot of conflict with the development team over how things are gone and things get scrapped and there's a lot of employee turnover but other than that, the game is the game company is great. That they have great PR and they have great games. The first uh, video talks about Glassdoor reviews, and CD Projekt actually kind of responded to the video by talking about uh, like that the company isn't meant for everybody. Glassdoor had a lot of negative reviews, but remember Glassdoor was mostly people who aren't from Poland reviewing. The company. The later videos corroborated um, the stories of former uh, CD Projekt employees to get a bigger, fuller picture. If you want to know the full extent of what the videos covered, look there. Uh, JT question brings up two specific allegations, one with key staff members leaving. We did have a key staff member leave for Gwent early on in production. And the um, engine for uh, Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, the CEO responds to this, and I can probably feel him sweating uh, to this question. It's it's actually pretty, it's a really, like, JT just elevated this YouTuber's allegations to a point where I have to talk about it. I'm really, I don't care about petty office politics. 
However, now the investors are all worried that there is actually something wrong with how uh, CD Projekt is running their company. And now uh, it's in their official documents. YouTuber Young Ye. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, uh, and so they're going to go look it up, the investors who are curious. What are these allegations? Is the story valid? What is this? And it, it can only be a negative impact on their share price. Uh and the CEO has talked about this and other things, and he's talked about the game engine, and he just assures us everything is fine, as you would expect the CEO and the C, um, CFO to do. They talk about the reduction of selling costs in this next question from GB from Wood Co. The reduction in um, selling costs for this Q3 as opposed to last Q3 is they downscaled Gwent's promotional expenses. So last Q3, they were pushing, hey, closed beta for Gwent is coming out, and they did the E3 announcement and all that hullabaloo. This year, uh, they didn't have that, and they're going to kind of save promotional costs until like the um, full release comes out. Another thing is uh, China, uh, well, they say, um, some of their promotion costs were uh, discounted by an agreement with our their foreign partners. This are refunded. Um, the partner I'm pretty sure that they're referring to is Gaia. Gaia is their partner in China. And uh, China has all these rules about who can do business in their country. Um, CD Projekt did some uh, conventions in China, like they release cards there and stuff like that, and they big announcements. And I can f totally see uh, Gaia taking control of all the promotion in that country due to the, you know, like Chinese companies will do business in China kind of laws that they have that there. Uh, and that's why selling costs are lower, marketing's being handled in. By another party okay <laughs> that's the general gist there it's actually kind of cool if you look into it. this is another cool question they talk um pko securities P, um, pl representing that i say l but this is a fan it's one it's a polish l um so the ceo talks about their technology stack um the technology stack for gwent will be updated to help support um certain gameplay features, including supporting card management. So what are, um, so what is this card management change is gonna be? Well, the thing that comes to top of my head is being able to craft cards in the deck builder. I can really see the card collection screen and the deck builder changing dramatically before, um, the re, um, rele the full release of the game. The other thing is they talk about um, Unity, which is going to still be the core engine for the game. Unity, as I've mentioned in previous videos, is used by developers who want to be multi-platform, particularly if they want to be both on a console or a PC and mobile. Now, it's hard to see Gwent on a mobile device in its current form, but it could take some changes in its design to make it more mobile friendly. And we can see some of that going to happen later. So they talk about R&D question um, things. They're gonna, most of this isn't really all that interesting. The technology stack was really cool, um, in my opinion, because there are a lot of features we still want in Gwent, but until they change the technology, we're not gonna see them, okay? The underlying technology. Uh, they, there's more stuff they can't talk about. They talk about the Chinese market here. They basically say the Chinese market received a more advanced product than the rest of the players because, you know, their closed beta is basically our public beta <laughs> version. So, of course, their version is much better than our original closed beta version was. 
but they don't they're not making any predictions off of that okay and that's the end of the q a i would like to end this video by talking about three things that i think that gwent should be careful about moving into the future the first thing i think they need to be careful about is controlling the cost of decks right now i think they've hit a good place where we only have four golds and six silvers i feel like if this stays the same that I could fall off the face of the earth, come back to Gwent, and still be able to play with the cards I have right now, because I would still have a full deck. And if I needed a new card to fill out a faction, um, an archetype that I like, I could get enough scraps for it in a decent amount of time to get that legendary. I do not feel like that for any other card games on the market right now. I feel like Duelist is way too expensive. Like you could spend a hundred dollars in that if you only had the core set and still not have the goal of the legendaries you need to um, craft the decks that you want hearthstone's the same way uh but with glenn i feel like any player could easily get their own deck together no matter how many expansions are added to the game because of the hard cap of how many legendaries and silvers can be put into the game uh, in your deck. And this is particularly important because Gwent has a lot of 25 to 34 year olds in its age group and that age group is the group that's going to be like okay I have to put games away for a while and focus on grad school or I'm getting married and you want those players to come back eventually and if you make your game unable for them to come back to the game that could be really bad. The final thing I would, uh, the next thing I would like to talk about is monetization. I feel that right now the game is poorly monetized. Yes, the game will probably live or die by the success of Thornbreaker, which will probably be a success that CD Projekt makes good products. But there are not very many other good options. Yes, you have ke buying kegs, and that's your bread and butter for any virtual card game. But I can't imagine anybody's buying Meteorite Powder. They even made a special for Meteorite Powder, but I can't, I still can't imagine them, that many people bought that, even at 50% price. They need to find other things. Uh, Devil Driven suggested cosmetic boards. Cosmetic items are really good in games like this because it doesn't, make, it doesn't create a big gulf between the free to play and the uh, whales of the community since both of them, uh, a cosmetic item offers no competitive advantage. Um, but I like, what kind of boards would these be? I was thinking maybe like mahogany or a glass table. Can you imagine a glass table where you can see the legs of your avatar underneath it? Like, like if you were Regis, you could see his legs down there, <laughs> just dangling and tapping or whatever to whatever's happening on the board. That'd be silly. Uh, another thing is you might be able to add announcers or extra sound effects to the game that you can buy. That might be cool. But you guys tell me in the comments what you think are other things that uh, Gwent could monetize to make the game more profitable. Final thing is um, leaders. Specific, specifically leaders attached to single player campaigns. So imagine if you could only get a leader by buying a single player campaign. That would greatly affect the competitiveness, the competitive factor of the game, especially between free to play and uh, pay to play players. So if elite, uh, leaders are notoriously hard to balance, imagine that in one of the um, uh, single player expansions that the leader they release with it is grossly stronger than its um, core set ones. That so much so that you have to kind of bot play him or lose on the competitive ladder. Yes, it would be balanced, but this would create a huge outcry from the player community because you have to pay in order to win. And you, yes, I would assume they would hotfix this, but the idea of that you could not play this leader 
uh, even if it was, a, especially if it was a leader attached to an archetype you really want to play. Um, regardless of how strong he is, uh, we'd really get on people's nerves, especially my nerves. That's one thing they really have to avoid, is not putting some important card into a single player campaign. I'm not sure if they, you can even craft things attached to single player campaigns. Well, unless it's like Hearthstone, in which case you can. Tell me what you guys think in the comments. For now, this is the end of the video. Um, I'm gonna need, I need to go and sleep. <laughs> I'm really tired. <laughs> Hope you guys like learning about these financial statements. I'll answer any questions you have in the comments.